Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, for some of you, it will be a different time of the day. Um, pretty interesting to, uh, to see you back in the uh, series of the recordings and the webinars by PCB. Um, just a few weeks ago, I got the invite and the question if we could um, do a next uh, meeting and webinar on the ISO 27000 series. Um, specifically with the uh, request, and we had quite some requests actually to make a bit of a comparison on the NIST, and um, that's exactly what we're going to show uh, for today. Um, together with me today is Erwin, is one of my Belgian colleagues, um, also a specialist in, in hacking and in cybersecurity, and he will um, take care of part of actually the, um, the NIST presentation for today. Um, so let me um, get started with it and I'll show you what he, we will cover for the session of today. Um, just before um, yeah, we continue with the technical content, as uh, just a bit of a reminder here, um, this session is recorded. Um, you will get access also to the presentation deck afterwards. And um, due to the huge response and the subscription actually of this, uh, this session, it will be uh, nearly impossible in practice to answer all questions. Um, so we will try to um, give some time on the question and answer on the end of the session, but um, keep posting the questions. What we will do as we did in the previous sessions is record all the questions and we will answer them one by one in the LinkedIn page, which I will, um, we will refer to later on, um, which allows actually us to, to review the questions, answer them, and provide some more background on the, on the page. So I posted a uh, page on LinkedIn with some additional references um, because, of course, there's a lot of things to discuss and uh, some interesting references, worksheets uh, that you can use after the session. Right. Um, but what we will do, first of all, is recap a bit of the sessions that we discussed uh, uh, in the previous ones. Uh, so the series started end of last year. Uh, where we did a quick uh, introduction as uh, an hourly session actually on the 27701 um, in comparison to uh, the 27001 series. Um, so there's a lot of interesting information on that one that allows us also to, um, to, to go into the details very quickly on the NIST. This is the, not the purpose actually to, to deep dive again on the previous content, but you can always consult it. Um, the, these have been recorded, you can access the presentation as, as you will be able to do so for this one. Um, what we will do after the quick recap is uh, introduce you to NIST. Um, it's a bit of a special one, uh, not, not like the ISO one, we will explain to that one. And then, of course, we will try to explain the SP800 series, uh, 53 documents specifically, because it's uh, closely mapping to the uh, 2701. And um, after that one, uh, we will compare a few things, which is the ISMS PIMS, and so that's 2701, and the NIST documents, and how you can use them or not, uh, depending on what you want to achieve with the documentations. Um, I regularly get the question also how about certification, how can you certify on that one and how does it work for the NIST, so that's as part of the uh, of the session for today and then of course um, when time permits we will uh, take care actually of uh, some Q&A on that one. Let's get started. Um, as mentioned, um, a bit of a recap on the previous session. So we started off last year and in December already, uh, where we did some introduction on the newly uh, published uh, uh, privacy standard. So that's a 27701. I will refer as of now to PIMS uh, for that one. And uh, as you remember from the previous sessions, um, it's, it takes care also of the GDPR implementation. It, it literally refers to the GDPR and how legislation can be handled with that uh, session, which we covered also in the January session for that one. And in uh, April, we covered uh, the practical implementation steps. So that might also be very handy actually to look into the session for today um, with this, uh, this kind of the background. And we did a bit of a sidetrack for session four 
where we explained the differences between the DPO of, and the CISO office and also the security auditing. Um, it will again touch back to some of the topics of today, so I hope that you can uh, look back um, to these sessions and learn from it. Um, it will help you out actually to understand the session of today. Um, that being said, um, you can find also the webinars in one page again on LinkedIn to, to make it fairly easy to, to cover it. Um, they all point back to the recordings um, that are pub published by PCB on YouTube and uh, the slide decks are also um, uh, shared um, on, on, the, on the platform so you can uh, look back and this, uh, this last line, line you can find back um, on the session of today. Just a quick few things um, yeah, to set some baselines. Um, we're looking into ISO and NIST and uh, you will notice actually that these are guidelines for security information security, cyber security. We're not talking about regulations, laws and so on, so be careful. Um, so um, the ISO and the NIST guidelines will help you to implement proper security. Um, it's not mandatory, you can make some choices on that one, so be, be careful um, in, in the wording, the way that you handle these uh, these guidelines and, and the standards on that one. Um, also very important, and this is specifically important when you look into the, the PIM system, privacy management system, it's clearly explained also in that standard as privacy and data protection has a different implementation. Certainly if you look into international interpretation of these areas, um, Privacy is not always data protection. Data protection is protecting your data, while privacy in most of the cases is about um, to, to feel safe, to feel personal, to, to keep you actually uh, your, your private life separated from all the rest. Right. Also very important to understand data protection is not information security and that's a very important distinction also um, in, in the PIMS and the ISMS system. Data protection is personal data. Uh, protecting uh, people's data, um, attributes, name, first name, last name, and so on, so the personal identifiable information, while information security is mostly um, about protecting company data. And of course, there's a crossover between both of them, it's very important to know there's a difference. Right? Again, uh, also, for example, between American interpretation and European interpretation, PII versus personal data might be interpreted differently, and certainly the NIST and, uh, is in that one very important. There are some strict definitions of PII and personal data, although that you will see that uh, most of the, uh, the best practice handle it uh, the same. Another one, very important, and we will come back at the end of, of the session of today, is the international versus regional best practices. Uh, in this case, for example, ISO is an international best practice standard. Uh, we'll give you a bit more of detail later on. While, for example, the NIST, although uh, free, freely and publicly available, is, is a, in essence a regional, meaning a, a national uh, concern uh, specifically in this case NIST is highly targeted at the, uh, the American side of, of information security but we'll come back to that one in, uh, at the end of the session. Right. Just to avoid any confusion, um, ISO 27001 is uh, referred to as ISMS Information Security Management System and the ISO 27701 um, to avoid any confusion in the, in the spelling is PIMS, Privacy Information Management System. Um, so I try to, um, to avoid the number stuff because uh, but you might get confused on a few things. So um, let's get started with that one. Um, to be clear, um, we only have an hour and it's nearly impossible and you will see you will get lots of information from the NIST and also from the ISO documents. Um, it's, we only have an hour so we can't cover the, the full details. Um, just be aware there's a lot of reference information so um, we're looking into a high level uh, information I hope that it will kickstart you to understand a bit better what ISO is, what in the ISMS system is doing, what PIMS is doing and what NIST is doing. Um, at least um, you have a, should have a good, good idea. Again we're not deep diving in again on the ISMS and the PIMS systems as we covered that one in the uh, previous session so if you need more information feel free to consult them. Um, they're freely published, publicly available, so um, 
I invite you to, to spend a few hours actually on this one for the previous sessions. Still, it's important to know that um, ISO 2701 is built up actually in two big parts. First of all, we have uh, the, the clauses, which are, are actually the management operations that you need to take care of, and which is called uh, is covered in, in 10 chapters. In essence, six of them um, require some implementation. That one, because the introduction and so on, is, uh, is not covered. And very important to know is that ISO is, is uh, very strongly based on the PDCA cycle plan, do, check, act. And uh, so it's a bit of a repetition and a management cycle. From an implementation point of view, we have the Annex, uh, which is also covered in the ISO 2702. And it has 14 main categories uh, going from A for Annex 5 to 18. And um, at the end, we'll see that we have uh, 114 controls of security measures you need to cover to make it certifiable. Right, so at the end of the session, you will also see in the uh, presentation of the slide deck that you will get some additional material on the education on that one that's covered by uh, PCP. Um, be aware that in the ISO series um, standards that end up with a number one are certifiable, meaning that you can uh, implement a standard and ask an auditor to verify that actually implemented everything correct. Um, also, the 701, the PIM system, is certifiable and Please be aware it's an add-on of the ISMS system and um, also be aware uh, it's not only about the 2701 or the, or the PIM system. There are some more documents in the 27,000 series. Some of them are free, some of them um, if you want to download them you need to have a license or a subscription to get access to it. But um, the 27,000 series do, do include some more detailed uh, information, for example, incident management, uh, cyber security, but also business continuity, communication security. And it's quite important to know this because we will make the comparison also with the, uh, the NIST documentation that has a pretty similar approach uh, for separating um, the sectors or the, the, the application areas actually for these uh, uh, implementations, right? We will not go to the nuts and the bolts, the details of the PIMS system. Be aware that the PIMS is an add-on specifically for data protection and PII protection um, on top of the ISMS system. That's where the difference is between data protection, uh, privacy, and information security. Um, still, uh, the PIMS uh, presentation, uh, the, the standard is pretty young. It has been published in August last year, so lots of uh, uh, companies are still prepping up to get it certifiable. Also, the auditing uh, uh, companies uh, need to prep on that one, so we will probably see um, some first uh, certifications for the privacy management systems upcoming this year or probably next year. It take, takes a while to, to get ready. Right. Um, also very important, and we'll point out a few extra things also discovered uh, in, in the previous sessions. Uh, be aware that um, the PIM system also is mapping to some privacy standards, also international privacy standards. So the most common one or the most known one right now is GDPR, but um, there are some other legislation coming up. And I um, heard from the PCB team that in the next session uh, in, in a few weeks, uh, we'll cover some other mappings uh, between the uh, the PIM system and other international legislation. Also very interesting to know, keep in mind that privacy in ISO standards is managed by the ISO 29100 series and specifically the fact that for example the DPIA or the PIA, so the privacy impact assessment is covered by that series. It's very interesting to know how to do some assessments and um, some of the topics come back in the next implementation. Good. Um, I will hand over the, the word now, right now to Erwin to um, to go into the details on the NIST and uh, you will hear me back at the end of this part on the technology part on that one. So to make a bit, bit of a comparison between NIST and the uh, ISO. So Erwin, there we go. It's yours. Thank you, Peter, uh, and thank you for preparing the slides for this session because uh, I think uh, it has been a hell of a job to do this because it's a very complex situation. I think that the audience will really appreciate that you're doing this. So let's discuss now a bit about NIST and the difference with the typical uh, ISO. So 
what is really important uh, to understand is that it's uh, an American uh, United States institution uh, exists uh, already from the last century. And the purpose is to um, define regulations a bit like IEEE, which is an international organization also for standards like ISO. Uh, but it's really to help uh, the American companies to uh, be competitive and to improve their uh, science, their standards, their technology, also to improve the economic security of the United States against the other uh, countries in the world, of course, and to improve the quality of life. Uh, what is very, very, very important here is that uh, when you are an American organization uh, and you want to work, for example, with the Department of Defense, they can stipulate in the agreement that you have to adhere to specific NIST standards like the NIST 853. And that's the main problem. For example, uh, let's say that you are an European company and that you have uh, implemented your ISO 27001 and that you have the certification to do that and that you want to work with, for example, an American organization that works for the Department of Defense, that American organization can also put in the agreement with you that you should become NIST compliant, the 853. And that implies that your ESO certification is not sufficient enough because you need to implement the additional controls that we will see now. So that's the biggest challenge I think that you will have. It's not because you have the ESO in place, with your ISMS and PIMS and whatever, you still need to be able to improve the controls to be NIST compliant. And the biggest issue there is there is no real certification of that possible. So it really, it's up to you to provide the evidence that you have implemented the additional controls needed for this NIST. Next slide, please. So NIST has done a lot of different publications in the last years. For example, the 800 series, it's all about security, but they also have about manufacturing, how to construct buildings and, and physics, chemistry. So there's a lot. So if you want to learn more about this topic, you can download them for free online and it's a very interesting read even in your uh, domain. So in this session, we will focus only on the special publications for computer security, the cybersecurity one, which is called the SP for special publication 800. And there are in that collection more about 200 documents already. And I think if you print them, uh, it will be a very expensive uh, experience because there are a lot of paper in there. And what is also very important to realize that most versions have revisions. So make sure that you always look at the last revision or the last version of a specific guide. Uh, so because that can be really a difference, for example, with the, the latest revision five of the SP800, there is a huge uh, difference with the revision four. Next slide, please. So here it all starts. So in the left column, we have the ISO compared with the latest revision of the SP853. So you immediately will see that the management clauses are the same, but we already have five more different control categories and much more subcategories. For example, it's like 300 more subcategories in total. So resulting in a total control, not only twice, but 10 times more controls that should be in place when you want to do NIST. 
that is a lot. I mean, I think uh, the left column also includes the, uh, the additional controls from the 27002, of course. But if you look at this, it will give you a lot of work. Because if you have the ISO, you are not there yet. You need to do a lot more. Next, please. So the revision five, it's only uh, released in uh, last month, uh, like two weeks ago, and it defines security and privacy controls for information systems and organizations. And that's also a big difference with the ISO 27001. They have included privacy as well in the revision five. So it's much, much more than only the security like Peter mentioned. So there's a big difference there as well. And also in those series, you can find the 812, which is an introduction to information security. And if you're new in cybersecurity, it's a good start. Then the 839 talks about information security risk. What is security risk? How can you measure it? How can you assess it? How can you mitigate it? It's very important. And then you have the 855 about performance management. And I don't think this is about performance of your website, but it's how well do you perform to implement your uh, security project and how you uh, make sure that you have your risk under control. But also you can find additional documents about patch management, how to uh, improve your firewalls, how to set up electronic mail, TLS, encryption, PKI, Bluetooth, and all that. Next slide, please. So, okay, so if you're ready for a deep dive, we want to go really uh, in a bit of detail about what are the, the documents. So, like I said, you can download the document for free uh, on this web page. Uh, you even can download additional supplements like uh, an Excel sheet with a full list of controls or with a, an index template in Word or in Excel as well. So, a lot of text on one slide, but uh, to give you an abstract about what is Nick. SP853 revision 5, and I think it's very important that you know this uh, by heart. It's a, in fact a catalog of security and privacy controls. So the two are important. I think that the main reason for NIST of doing this is, is that they don't have like in Europe the legislation on a global level like GDPR. So I think that they looked at GDPR and said, okay, if we want to have everything in place, we need to include that in our uh, procedures. And it talks about information systems, so everything IT related and organizations using those information systems. And the purpose is to protect organizational operations and their assets, the individuals working in those organizations and other organizations like suppliers, partners, uh, customers. And they have looked at different set of threats and risks, uh, including hostile attacks, like for example, terrorist attacks, human errors, of course, natural disasters, for example, uh, there's an earthquake, uh, uh, which is in California, for example, in the States, of course, the typical situation, structural failures, uh, which has to do with your building collapsing, uh, attacks by, for example, foreign intelligence, it can happen, and this is the real cyber war. Be aware that this happens, and privacy risks. And somebody stole all your customer data and wants to uh, publish it and is blackmailing you. The controls are supposed to be flexible and customizable, but of course not interpretable, and it means the control should really define what you need to do, and it should also be uh, able to be assessed as part of uh, do you have the control, yes or no? And also, it has to be implemented organization-wide to manage your business risk. So what is happening, it will look at your mission, 
statement, at your business needs, at the regulations that are applicable to your business, also the legal requirements that you need to do business, and then it will prove the functionality effectiveness and it needs to provide assurance, the trust. And I think that there's a small typo um, in trust there, Peter. Thanks. I know, I will slide. fix it at the end of the session, so we'll do it. Thank you. Okay, and of course, we always have add-ons because there was not enough place in one uh, document, so we have some additional add-ons that help you, that give you guidance on how to do, for example, risk assessment, like uh, described in the ISO 27001, and what do you need to do to assess your risks? And we're talking here as well about the business risk, but also what are privacy risks? How uh, can you learn more about that? And uh, also the 39 is about risk management processes and strategies. How do you do risk management? Um, then you can also have like a comprehensive risk management process. Then you have uh, an appendix to do guidance on assessing the effectiveness of controls. So what is really important is not stating that you have the control in place, but that you're also able to assess the effectiveness of that control. For example, uh, you say, ah, okay, we have an antivirus uh, solution. Okay, show me the evidence that it's detecting malware and that you have tested it uh, to make sure that it's working like it should. And show me the evidence that you don't have any uh, malware uh, outbreaks in the last year. Also, the 53B provides guidance on privacy as well. So if we look at the, the structure of the document, we have the first chapter one, which is the introduction. And then we have the fundamentals like ISO, and then chapter three is full controls that you need to implement, uh, reference, and then the appendixes with the glossary, of course, the explanation of the, the specific uh, terms and terminologies that we are using in cybersecurity, and of course, a whole a mumbo jumbo of acronyms that we all love and hate in the IT world. And very important, there is at the end of this document, it's a summary of all the controls, which is of course very, very interesting because you can skip a lot of pages by just looking at the control summaries to see, okay, how are we doing and where do I need to look at to improve that uh, security posture? So what is chapter one? Chapter one will discuss the need to protect information, systems, the organization, and the individuals working in your organization. It will discuss the purpose of the procedure, the applicability, who needs it, why do we need it, and who is the specific audience to read the document. Of course, we won't, don't want anyone reading 500 pages if it's not the right audience. And also define like an uh, organogram, a hierarchical organization to define the different responsibilities because we all know to have this kind of uh, risk assessment and controls in place, we need to have management buy-in. And of course, it will relate to other NIST publications. And of course, very important, make sure that you're using the latest revision, which is number five, which is created in 2020, and that you don't use number four, which has been created like four years ago, because that's a bit uh, already obsolete and legacy. Um, just a quick add-on on this one. Um, be aware that lots of reference material, um, like the sys controls and documentation that you will find on the internet, is still reverting or referring to revision four. So be careful with it because uh, lots of comparison documents by other vendors or by other systems uh, might miss uh, the latest update. And it, of course, it takes some time to to have these updated. But if you, if you detect this, might might be useful to warn them to update their documentation. Uh, I think you're mentioning my uh, LinkedIn uh, remark yesterday where I uh, looked at uh, a mapping of the CIS critical controls against the, the NIST uh, 800 and that was indeed mapped against revision 4 because there was a huge gap 
in everything related to application security penetration testing, which is now solved, of course, but it, it, it gave a, a really uh, an awkward feeling on how is this possible, but again, it was the wrong uh, revision that they were using in the mapping. So really be careful about that. It's a very good remark, PJ. Thank you. Chapter two will discuss the fundamental concepts. So it's in fact a really uh, a very interesting document to read when you're new in cybersecurity because it will, first of all, NIST wants to make sure that everybody understands the same terminology and the concepts. And then it will help you to implement everything that is needed uh, to improve security and privacy. So then they will discuss on a global level, what are these controls? How are they structured? How are they organized in a catalog? So it's like uh, when you browse a catalog of Ikea, you have the bedroom furniture and you have the kitchenware. Well, you have, will have the same catalog of for these controls but also what are the different approaches to implement these controls, which is also very interesting instead of uh, being a bit vague uh, on how to implement them, they really give you an approach on how to do that. And they also discuss the relationship between security and privacy and also the gaps between the, those two and how you can provide trustworthiness and give assurance because assurance is what you want in the end. Assurance for your partners, for your employees, for your management, for your board of directors. So chapter three is the IKEA catalog. And so you have a consolidated catalog of security and privacy controls that you need to implement that you need to assess, that you need to uh, provide evidence, that you need to in inventorize, that you have these things in place. So it will provide a full uh, discussion section to explain the purpose. Why do you need this control? And it will give you the information needed to do a correct implementation and assessment of that control. And it will also give you a list of related controls. So it will help you to see the relationship and dependencies among controls, and also gives a list of references, external references, supporting you to be able to implement that. And it will be very helpful, of course, for the organizations uh, that they have like one reference guide that they need to follow. Okay, so here we have a, a nice table with the structure of the controls and the related families. And of course, for each family, they have created a nice acronym. So what families are we talking about? First of all, access control. Secondly, awareness and training, audit and accountability. Now, audit and accountability is also a very important one because it can go really broad in the terms of accountability also about your company figures. Then we talk about assessment, authorization and monitoring, configuration management, contingency planning, identification and authentication, which is in fact totally different, but they group them together to make sure that you are able to identify and authenticate everybody needed. We have incident response, but also maintenance. Media protection. Media protection, for example, it's something you don't see in ISO, but it's how do you protect your brand? How do you talk with media when there is an incident and all that? Also a very important one is physical and information, environmental protection, planning, program management is the high level how do you implement the different security projects and have a, like a reporting to your board personal security and then of course personal identify information processing and transparency of using that and protecting your privacy risk assessment again business risk system and services acquisition system and communications protection system and information integrity, 
and supply chain risk management. And these are the different families used by NIST. So then there will be a detail provided for every security control and measure. So it will have an identifier, it will have a name, it will define the base control. So what is the definition of the security measure that should be in place? What is the task for the organization? So it's a really a defined parameter. How can you enhance that control? What are the additional sources to find more information? And what are the links to other controls that are related or are needed to have in place before implementing this specific control? For example, if you need to implement authorization, of course, you need to have authentication in place first. So here we see an example of a specific control. So we need to have an audit storage capacity, which is a control name. It is the family, its uh, identifier is AU4. It's an organization defined parameter, so it has to be implemented organization wide. What is the base control? It means that you need to allocate audit record storage capacity to accommodate. What is the discussion? It's why you need that. What are the related controls? And you see that there are hyperlinks, so you can really click on them to see how are they related. And you see that they also are relating to additional families. Like at the last one here is SI4, which is an other family. And what are the control enhancements? How do you do that? Well, you need to offload audit records onto a different system or media that, than the system being audited. So it means that you need to just have like a copy that cannot be changed and you need to have it copied on another media. And then here is a, an example without a reference, uh, but I think that the explanation is very straightforward. And then, of course, to have the control implementation classification, so you can have uh, different implementation approaches here. So you can have a common implementation which applies to multiple systems, or it can be just system specific. Uh, for example, if you have like a uh, cloud and on premise, well, it's very difficult to have a common implementation for those two. So you will have like one for the cloud and one for your on premise data center, or you can have a hybrid where you mix both implementations. And of course, it's very important because there's always the battle, is it security versus privacy? Uh, how does it work? How can we guarantee the trustworthiness, uh, which is an important part of the risk management strategy on a high level? And what is the impact on that trustworthiness? Uh, is it functional? Uh, what is the effectiveness of the security? Is it still possible to have the people do their jobs and be uh, as a company organization agile and, and uh, efficient? And does it provide enough assurance? Does it mean that we have enough confidence and can we measure that confidence that the control and the implementation of that control I'm not sure if Aaron's still online, but um, one of the things that um, that's very important, and you will see actually also in the number of sub controls and the technical measures. And then you have the the yellow ones. Yes, there we go. Peter, the start is the the most important ones to start with. Okay. Good. Next part of the discussion is um, rather, um, like of course, um, that's also one of the main goals of the sessions is, is now um, you have had all the details on, on the NIST, of course, in a high level overview. Um, how does it work and how do you compare actually the ISMS and the PIM system, do you remember? It's uh, uh, linked to the ISO 2701 or the 27701, and how do you map actually with the uh, with the systems? 
I can um, be aware that um, you will see that the level of detail in this is way higher and more in detail than what you can expect actually and the requirements actually in the ISMS system as Aaron explained in the beginning of the session. Um, so ISMS is rather taking a high level approach is um, split up in two parts while this is rather mixed in the, in the NIST implementation. Um, so the clauses taking the management responsibilities, you will typically see the accountability the responsibilities covering uh, that, that part of the item. And part two, which is rather the annex, is uh, looking into the operational security measures. So you will see also some additional guidance in the ISO 2702 or in these, the topic specific uh, documents. Um, Although that, that ISO 2702 is doing some advisory and suggestions, you will not find that level of detail that you have met right now within the NIST implementation. So um, there is some room in that sense to um, to use, for example, the NIST implementations with the details and you can plug it in in the, uh, in the ISO one. But the other way around might be more difficult as Aaron explained in the beginning of the session. Hi, Peter. But, Sorry um, for interrupting. Can you please just go back to the previous slide? Because I think that some of our audience missed a couple of... Uh, this one? Points. Yes. I think some of... Um, them, yeah, what, you, what you will... Yes. What you will see here is that um, the, the point here is what, what, I, well, what we checked here is the number of controls and um, just for your information, we will not deep dive on the number of items be being covered on each of these sections. Um, they will be included in the publication of the slide deck. And you will notice that actually um, the, the items being covered in these categories are go over the 100 controls. And so you will see that there's a lot of effort actually in the, uh, in the items here. And the ones that are marked red and yellow are, are the, the most important ones or the biggest ones in the in the section so that's where the difference comes in as we discussed from the beginning of the section um you, you remember that we had more or less for 114 controls and over thousands in the nist ones and so the biggest ones are actually marked by these stars so it's worth looking into it um to to give you a bit more detail you will find actually in the publication of this presentation deck that we have split up in the more de more detailed slides the exact explanation the calculation actually of the controls um but if you're looking into the NIST, it might be worthy to to um to look at these specific ones right um i hope that that's is enough to um to do to pick back up actually on the story on the, the on the comparison between isms bims and nist on, on that one um be be aware that the the the, the NIST is um, taking the the information security and the and the privacy or the data protection in one uh, global document. That's not the case um, with ISO. Um, you will see that the PIM system, so the twenty seven seven o one, is actually transforming the seven o one and uh, linking together actually a few of these documents. And I, I mentioned them over here twenty seven o one. 2702 the 29,100 series and um, they, they're looking up actually or referring also to international legislation like for example the GDPR or the American legislation. Um, while as you probably have understood right now is a NIST it goes very much into details how to implement it um, so one way or the other, you could use the suggestions in the NIST to implement ISO, but the other way around, so as, as Aaron explained in the beginning of the session, is that if you need to conform or to make it compliant to NIST and you start off from the ISO implementation, you might need to run into some trouble on that one and, and need some extra work to, uh, to, um, to have a look at. So uh, in, in essence, um, ISMS and ISO is providing some implementation guides, not in detail, so it's rather a checklist in that sense. It helps you to think about uh, security, but in most of the cases, if you really need to hand, have some hands-on guidance on how to do it, what actually do you need to, to implement, uh, you might use, for example, the NIST in that sense. It's a bit of an advantage and disadvantage in that sense that you uh, are, have some freedom of implementation to, um, to be compliant. Um, and you can choose your uh, frameworks that you want to implement to, uh, to, do, be, uh, to do, do the, the ISO compliance. And not only NIST, but um, you could choose, for example, ISACAS, 
or PCB's implementation, for example, to the framework, depending on your type of organization that you uh, you would look at, uh, like to, to implement. Uh, on the other hand, um, as also mentioned in the beginning, um, ISO is an international implementation, and if you look into the history of the documentation of ISO, you will see that lots of the common ground comes back from national implementations, and NIST has uh, been playing a, a huge role in that one. Um, from history level, so um, they are an important reference level for the ISO documentation, but you will see actually that uh, the ISO documentation in most of the cases is not that detailed um, to, to, to allow that international interpretation on that one. On the other hand, uh, as mentioned already, NIST is, is very much based on US level, American implementation on that one is extremely detailed, very extended, and uh, now we cover only the 800-53 uh, document, but there's a lot of other uh, documentation that you can look at it. Um, it's very well organized, super practical guidance and references, and you have also seen in the explanation of Erwin that the documentation is highly organized and, and very interesting also to navigate through the documentation so you can easily find all the references you need um, to, to make it work on, on that one. I added also a few things and, and uh, I mentioned also in the explanation of the NIST. Uh, the NIST is publi uh, publishing all their documentation for free. It's, it's a sponsored organization by the US government and they are f completely free to, to download. You can easily use it and that's not the case for the ISO documentation, although that you will find um, some documents on the ISO um, publicly available. Um, the ISO 2701 and 2702, for example, are not uh, for free. You need to download them uh, by license. And depending if, if you have a multiple documents to download, you can also go for a subscription, but that will cost you some money actually to um, to download uh, for that one. And that, that's the way that ISO works. Is, um, they, their organization works on the fees that they, they get from the documents they, they publish. Right? So, um, one other thing, and that's also a very typical question, is can you certify for NIST um, or can you certify for ISO? Um, as I already mentioned in the introduction of the sessions, have a look at the ISO standards, usually the ones that end up with one are certifiable, in this case, uh, specifically the 2701 ISMS system and the 2701 the PIM system are certifiable. Um, I referred here also to the 9000 series, which is a quality management system, because 90% uh, of the approach on the 27000 series are based on 9001, and, and just for your reference, the PDCA cycle plan to check act is exactly described in the 9000 series. So. Um, it's built on the ISO international approach, and that means that um, if you implement following the ISO rules, you can have it certified. There is a full audit mechanism being supported by ISO, um, built on international recognition, both on the American side, both on the international, European, uh, or, or, or the other parts, uh, Asia part, um, they all have the ISO recognitions, and the uh, national organizations recognize each other for doing international uh, audits. I did refer to the GDPR, NIST, and Cyber Act. Um, the GDPR is all, all pretty well known, although uh, European legislation. Um, it does uh, require also international organization to comply with it, so it's not strictly limited to uh, European areas. Um, same thing for NIST, and NIST is actually the, the European directive for critical infrastructure, and now, just last year, um, also the European Commission and the European government uh, uh, agreed and launched the Cyber Act, which will take care actually of um, um, certifying products, people and processes actually to be cyber secure. Um, as similar to the GDPR, it has launched last year, it will get active next year, so again, a two-year delay, and I will see actually that there will be uh, more and more demand also to certify and to audit products to be cyber secure. So this will be a huge impact again also for publication and use of products, services. Um, so it's slightly different than what, so as what GDPR does. GDPR is rather a management system for data protection while the Cyber Act will focus on the, uh, the product security. Um, pretty similar to what we um, already have seen with the common criteria, but in this case uh, rather a uh, larger scale on, on implementation on that one. Right? 
Um, why is it important? Because um, the ISO is based on the international standards, it's standardized, it's, it's pretty similar, so um, you have the same audit process and um, mutual recognition means that if a company is recognized in, in one of the countries that is uh, um, joined on, on the ISO uh, um, standards, they can actually do some audits cross-border and um, in, independent of the company, um, it's recognized internationally in that one. Right. Um, again, mentioned very important. This is also difference with the the NIST. Um, it's uh, linked to other standards, and uh, one of the things, for example, you will not see or not explicitly at least is that the NIST is not based on the PDCI cycle, while the ISO standards are, um, which means that that um, it's not a single implementation. But you also need to take care of of repetition. You need to take care of conditional, like continuous improvement. Sorry. Um, so once you run a cycle, you need to evaluate it again and then improve the cycle. So once you start in that uh, in that train, uh, it never stops, and that's an important part also of the ISO implementation. Right. A bit of a bad news in this sense, as also also mentioned by Erwin uh, in the explanation of the NIST documentation, there is no official certification for NIST. And um, just a few weeks ago, I explicitly asked a question also to the NIST, and they confirm actually there's no same, no, no, not a similar process of what is what is recognized in the in the ISO, but. Um, be aware there is an assessment process, there is a performance process, but it's not interna internationally recognized as, as you would could, uh, of would or could ex um, compare to the ISO standards. And there is a performance management, but um, that, that's exactly the difficulty if you need to implement uh, a NISTA-like system is getting the performance checked is uh, not as an alternative. And this is exactly what is covered in the NIST in that sense. So there is an auto assessment framework in there. Um, so you can have some audits, but again, um, then you need to take care of, the, of yourself. So there's uh, there are some guidance on assessing and risk assessment, as also mentioned before in the session. Um, some continuous monitoring, but it's not uh, recognized as such uh, on, on an international level. So uh, there are some alternatives, but as, as what man, uh, Evan mentioned, there's a lot of work to do to um, to get this up and running. Right. Good, Ardian. Uh, before we go to the Q and A, some other wording from a PCB level. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Peter and Erwin, for delivering this very detailed and very informative session. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, PCB offers courses on ISO 27001 and 27701 uh, 20, and 27701, uh, which help you show your dedication in implementing and managing privacy-related frame frameworks, and most importantly, get recognized worldwide. Now, uh, we'll, I think we have time to answer two or three questions for this session. Uh, the first question is, do we have the option to select our own controls in NIST based on our organization's SOA? And when do you want to take that one? Where can we see the question? Or then is it somewhere in the question the, the, box? The, or question, it, uh... the question, yeah, you, you probably don't, don't see it on, on your side, Evan. The question was, do we have an option to choose which controls we implement in, in, in NIST? Um, I think that you can map it against the, the control defined in their catalog, but uh, I assume that it would be a difficult one because uh, having another control that's not in the catalog, it means that I, I don't see that happening because it's so uh, detailed that everything that is out there should be in the catalog. Of course, you can have, you can give it another name. You, for example, let's say that you, uh, implemented uh, two-factor authentication, and the uh, NIST uh, is talking about multi-factor authentication. Okay, it, it, it's a different definition, but it will be the same. So you can say, okay, that, that's that's the same. Uh, but to invent a uh, control that's not in the list, I think it, that would be very hard because there should all be in there. 
Second thing, it's think also very important to know that um, as, as the ISO is that the NIST is also risk based. So um, the technology choice is up to you, but it needs to cover the risk management in that sense. Um, but um, again, the, the list of controls mentioned in the NIST is, is very uh, prescriptive in that sense. And getting getting out of that area is, is quite difficult. Uh, thank you. Uh, before moving to the second question, I would like to announce that PCB has already started distributing ebooks as well through the PCB store. Uh, we have started with the ISO 22301 uh, 2019 version implementation guide, which defines and explains important steps in the implementation, implementation of a business continuity management system. Uh, for more information, please uh, check the link that I sent you on your chat box. Now, uh, moving on with the second question, I think, uh, Peter, you also covered this, but if you can just go over it again shortly. Can we use the NIST framework while implementing the ISMS? Uh, yeah, yes, let's explain my Erwin. It is um, it's, it's quite detailed. So, so there, there's also some reference documentation um, how to compare the, the NIST to the ISO 2701. Um, due to the fact that it's highly detailed, yes, you can, um, and there is a bit more freedom in the ISO implementation, which framework, uh, implementation framework you would choose. So, uh, using NIST to, to prove ISO compliance is fairly doable. The other way around, so using ISO, as explained by Aaron, to, to prove NIST compliance will be way more difficult because then there's a lot of more work to do. Thank you, Peter. Uh, another question is, uh, do we have an idea of the adoption ratio among companies that adopted NIST versus ISO? Um, I can't answer that right now. I need to look it up. Um, as, as mentioned, um, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting question, but not easy to answer because um, not for NIST and not for ISO, there there's no no reporting on that one. Is you can, for example, find on the ISO organization um, there is a survey website actually for them that um, that explains how many ISO implementations there are per country and not per standard. So you will, for example, see that the adoption rate for ISO 27001 versus the ISO 9000 is more or less one to ten. Um, but there is no obligation to report it, so it's up to the customer that implements the certification to report it or to um, to announce it on the websites, but there's no central uh, information gathering on that one. And due to the fact that the NIST does not offer any official uh, auditing, there is neither any rep uh, reporting on that one, so it's very difficult to find how the ratio is actually from NIST between ISO and, and then ISO uh, implementations. Thank you, Peter. Now more a, of a technical question. Uh, which controls do I have to assess first just after implementing the ISMS? Well, um, certainly if, if, you, if you think about certification, there, there's no um, first to, to go, but there, what you can find, and now that, that's a good question and that's uh, there are some mandatory documents to present if you want to get certified and um, the support of the management in that one is very important and one of the key elements to, to at least start off is risk management. Um, this is one of the key components in your uh, in your setup because um, the risk management will allow you to assess uh, the budget you have and the, the risk that actually will, will, will propose actually in the system and um, so in, in the matter of priority, risk management comes first, and before the risk management, you must make sure that your management is with you and supports the implementation of the ISMS system. Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, this is a more, more of a general question actually, can both NIST and ISO be used in one organization, or do you have to use one or the other? Um, I think we also covered it um, during this session. Um, so, as the ISO is a is a shorter list of requirements to to check um, and less details, I think you can perfectly combine. And so, so you could easily um, use the technical deep deep dive controls of the NIST to to prove or to implement ISO implementation. Um, 
depending on your type of organization, the size of the organization, um, that then this might be a good control or a framework to implement. In some other cases, um, depending on the demands, vendors, management, and so on, you might uh, um, need to have a look at a different uh, other frameworks. And uh, for example, one of the other ones, one of the competitors in, in that sense is, for example, COVID, COVID by Isaka, um, which is uh, usually implemented in a more um, audit level organization on that one. But um, due to the fact that the NIST is that um, highly defined, highly detailed, um, you could easily use it as a sort of guidance, technical guidance to implement your eyes. Thank you, Peter. Now, Peter, uh, would... yes, Erwin? Go ahead, Erwin. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so would you think, Peter, that uh, if you look at this, uh, it's a, a superset of ISO, and if you're an organization and you have nothing in place yet, wouldn't it be the best way to start with just doing the ISO and see how you get the experience of doing that before going to NIST? Yes, absolutely. And that, that's also one of the, the, the typical uh, misinterpretations actually on ISO, uh, meaning that ISO does allow you to grow your system. Um, so there is an important fact of maturity in your system. and. Um, what I usually refer to, to the implementation of ISO, or at least in the audits, is um, if you want to have certification, it's, it's usually the bare minimum that you get uh, organized. And, and exactly as you propose right now is uh, doing some limited controls, having some basic management system in, in place, and then growing the maturity and exactly is, is doing that is using the basics of ISO and then growing into a NIST-alike implementation and making a choice. Um, all the way you will find out that you, you will get better control on the risks and, and uh, most of the companies take a few years actually to get the full control, which is the NIST-alike approach. Um, I refer to the previous sessions where you um, you must be aware that your certificate for your ISO implementations, which is recognized, is only valid for three years, so it expires in, in three years. Most companies start investing into it, start grooming the system, and then start looking into the technical controls, which are highly detailed, like the NIST is doing, and uh, only get the full maturity probably after the three years. So, so your suggestion to start off with ISO and then go into the NIST-like implementations is perfect. And um, to, to add to the other question before this one, I think it's really important, for example, when you're looking at uh, to, to uh, buying a, or, or uh, subscribing to an ISMS, it should be able to uh, do also this when you need it, not only limit you to the ISO 270102, but also be able to implement the NIST controls in your ISMS. I think that is a really a strategic, important decision before deciding on how to do your internal ISMS because otherwise you will block yourself in because the ISO is just the ISO and if you really need that list in place, it has to be supported by your ISMS to allow to add these controls for the risk assessment and the evidence and the management. That being said, um, yes, and very important, certainly if you have international relations, certainly working on American market, then as explained by Aaron, and also it's very important to have an eye on that NIST one because it's very likely that you will get questions or, or some uh, uh, assessments based on the NIST. So um, depending on your business and if you have American business or if you have international business, uh, it, it's really worth uh, looking at the NIST and, and align as much as possible to that standard. Uh, with that, uh, we'll conclude today's session. Thank you, Peter Irvin, again for this outstanding session, and I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, this session, uh, once again, will be recorded and posted on our website and YouTube channel, along with the slides of the presentation. Also, I would like to inform you that during November, we will organize another similar session, only this time we will compare uh, 27001 with C. CCBA and New York City Shield Act. Uh, we will compare what are the differences and similarities. 
uh, we will send you the newsletter invitation today shortly. For more information about our webinars or the PECB store, please visit our website www.pecb.com. Thank you all once again and have a great day.